needs to know that we... Uh, uh, BG time. BG time. <laughs> okay, let's go. Uh, <coughs> that's better. All right. Mm -hmm. This time we can see Twitch. Okay, we're live about a minute before we need to be live. Oh, yeah. And then we've then got the ads. Commercial. Okay. <laughs> but that's all right. It's still recording us. I mean, we're actually being... Well, it's now one, so we're actually live now. I want to see that, that movie. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think anybody can actually see that that's no, watching us. No, but, no, no. Uh, yeah, we're seeing uh, Ash versus the Evil Dead. That's the name I was looking for. I keep <laughs> thinking of Shaun of the Dead, but it's a whole different beast. <laughs> all right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Brooke Waters um, from Stickmen Media. Um, we have... Fiona, who you've met previously, Hi. and today we're introducing Lincoln, who's a Hello. concept artist for Stickman Media. Um, so we are going to talk about the process of, uh, well, actually what we're going to do is introduce the whole team, uh, or the whole art team. Um, we're going to start with Lincoln, probably because he's first in the process. Concept art is uh, where all the, the visual aspects of the good ideas start. Um, so what we're looking at in the background is something called an orthographic drawing. So this comes after the initial concept art. This is when <coughs> we've chosen a character and uh, the 3D modelers have to make it. So Lincoln, tell us a bit about creating orthographic art. Uh, yeah, orth orthographics are they're kind of a tricky little beast in that um, for this one I probably started with... Um, Yes, the viewers can see that backplate image, mm -hmm. can't they? Yeah. Um, the, the they can see whatever's up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, um, the larger view on the left... Uh, but you should probably look there, so you're looking yeah. at the camera. It's disturbing <laughs> looking there, because the, the video is a couple seconds behind, and try not to look at us. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah the, the bigger view on the left is what I guess you'd call a perspective view, um, kind of trying to show the character in pose and try and get some feeling of is, is um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not mood, but just sort of whether whether he's a badass or yeah, whether he's, he's sort of a meek character. His character and his attributes. Yeah, yeah like if, if he's hunched over and all these kind of things and just get a feeling for how he, how his posture is and things like that. Um, and from, that was the initial sketch. And then from that, the three on the right, which is your front side and, and back, is really more to hand off to the 3D modelers so that they've mm. got um, little aspects of the uniform and armour and costume that, that to me might just be obvious but sometimes you'll hand it to a 3D modeler and, and they just won't understand it like for example um, looking at this one the horns on the helmet for example in the front pose it's pretty obvious they sort of they come out and they curl down but the bonus of the shots on the on the far side, the, the front side and back, is it, it really shows, okay, they come out in the side view, for example, you can see how they curl out and come forwards and the little silver spike horns on the top stick up and come out at an angle. And these are little things that sometimes you lose in the perspective view on the left. So I guess it's more about clarifying things um, so that you don't, after the model has spent three or four hours working on something, have a look over their shoulder and go, why did you do that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's usually the little details, like at the moment I'm doing a character who's wearing suspenders, old fashioned, so... Um, we will get to see that. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps I should start S that. Suspenders thing. that hold your pants up, and a good reason for doing the orthographics is um, the back of the character on where the suspenders join. Um, there's obviously a way, a lot of ways of doing that with buckles and domes and clips and things. So it's showing it and making it, almost idiot proofing it, so that um, not not that our three D modelers are idiots, but <laughs> yeah. sometimes. But you have great authority, don't you, as the concept? Yeah. You're the guardian of the concept, so <laughs> you get to enforce stuff. Um, another good reason for doing it is that sometimes, you, for example here, our one of our modelers is uh, from another country, so it might be that in his country people don't wear suspenders very often, or maybe culturally or historically they haven't worn suspenders into him. It might be just a belt, but um, in this example on the back of the suspenders they come together and join into one piece. So. 
Yeah. So this is the this is the new one you did today, basically that we're looking at now. Yeah, I was painting this uh, for the last hour or so. Mm -hmm. And on the right screen there, you're looking at reference for boots, I yep. take it? Yeah. Um, Are you not after new shows? No, <laughs> no. Doing a bit of eBay on this, <laughs> yeah, while he's supposed to be working. Yeah. Um, so reference is pretty important because obviously the time period from this one is um, sort of 1700s, well, 1800s-ish. 1800s, so yeah. yeah. 1850 um, onwards, I think. So if you could read close enough, you'd probably see them looking up Victorian men's footwear and things like that and just getting an idea of the style and shape so it's no no good putting this guy in big um chunky army style boots because it'll just it'll throw things out of whack it's all got to fit um and you probably see i'm just in the main image lassoing things and cutting you know, cutting the shoes off and playing around with them um yeah what tool are you using here uh this is in photoshop uh, which is my, I'm a 2D artist, so most of my time normally is spent in Photoshop, but um, of late I've spent a lot more time working in Unreal, but that's just the, the nature of some of the work we're doing at the moment. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. I think we've got a whisper there, but uh, I don't have a whisper so bad. <laughs> so Lincoln, how long have you been doing this 2D artwork? Um, Ooh, I've actually lost track. Uh, <laughs> I would guess about seven or eight, between eight, maybe between seven and ten years. Um, I'm a guy that always did enjoy drawing stuff, but um, in my earlier days I was working in IT in more technical roles, and at a point I just decided to do something I enjoyed more mm -hmm. than, than the higher salary that you get in that, in that business. So. Um, yeah, a lot of it, for me, I, I was a strange one, I didn't do a course like a lot of people will do, a um, you know, polytech course or something like that, or one of those things. I pretty much self-taught myself from home um, by watching a ton of YouTube videos and training DVDs and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have to say which it's the hard way to do it. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, yeah. A lot of online training material, I, I was always interested on the 2D side, but um, it, I don't know, I've kind of done it the hard way. People who've gone through a course, probably there's a huge benefit to picking up not just 2D, but learning how to do the 3D stuff better. Um, I'm always trying to pick up stuff off our 3D modelers because it's handy. So I guess the moral of that story is to always try and get as many applications or uh, under your belt, like even if it's only a general knowledge of how to use something like Maya or Blender, some 3D application. Yeah. So Maya is the, the, the uh, typical modelling application that 3D modellers use when making games? Yeah, and um, obviously if I was to stick by my the, the letter of the law of my contract, uh, I might be just wanting to use only Photoshop, but that's not necessarily well, that's you know my job description is to do 2D art, and quite often when you work for a studio, especially a smaller studio, you might have to be a jack of all trades. So it's good to know mm. how to use 3D, even if it's not what you love doing, <laughs> and any other application you can get your hands on. Actually, you've had quite a challenge recently because you've also had to become a technical artist. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, also learning the games engine. Yeah, which is I mean, if I, I quite enjoy it, so I guess you got to approach it with that attitude to try new stuff, so it's all good. Yeah, so here's the reality of actually streaming these jobs. Um, just working on these boots takes <laughs> quite a long period yeah. of time. Maybe um, we should... We haven't got a ability to speed it up in real time or what? That's, that's a good question. I wonder if we can do that. Because I, I did spend a while noodling around with these shoes trying to figure out, especially when you've got something like that on a strange angle. The good thing with a zombie is um, you can get away with having some weird foot positions because they tend to be tripping over themselves. Let's skip forward a bit. We don't seem to be able to play at a higher speed, so I'm going to skip go. forward to... Oh, you can, yeah, skip, skip forward. But it's been a long time noodling into the shoes, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. There we high. go. Now we're looking at the tear in the trousers, by the look of it. Yeah. 
trying to trying to shape and really up a bit. Um, this is obviously my what I call, call my perspective view or isometric, where I'm trying to put a little bit more detail into it. Later on, you'll see me working up the the two the three side um, the orthographic views, which yeah. they're not necessarily as detailed. Like when you zoom in, they might be a little bit pixelated and have little little bits that aren't perfect, but they're there purely to um, convey the idea to the 3D model of, of exactly how things sit. Okay, so this guy, uh, so we've got a range of zombies um, from fleshy, so basically freshly dead, <clears throat> where uh, they still have most of the skin on their face, um, down to um, bony, where uh, basically they have almost no skin. This guy, um, although he's bony, he's not as old as like our troops or things like that. You can tell by the way you've done the clothes in this that he's uh, he's actually not as decayed. Yeah. His clothes aren't as decayed as... Uh, Usually a, a good indication of that is for something like a zombie is sort of around the face. You'll see that the nose area in particular is, yeah, I guess he's only half decayed. Yeah. One of the first things to go would be the nose and there's those cavities, the sinus cavities and He's still got a jaw it's hanging on there, and he's still got eyeballs. But, yeah. They look um, a bit withered, but, yeah. Yeah. but <laughs> and he's bit, got some hair. A bit cross-eyed. You can see there I'm actually trying to brighten up the eyes and do some little colour dodges where I try and focus the light source on that side of the face to draw the, to kind of draws your eye there. Um, clearly I'm chewing chewing gum in the <laughs> video too. <laughs> <laughs> if we were going faster, we, <laughs> that would look hilarious. Okay, let's skip ahead a bit. Okay, now uh, we seem to be working on yeah, the... Yeah, at the moment in that video I'm working on the background, the stuff behind the zombie, tr to try and sell any shot you want to use lighting. So you can see I threw a little light gradient in behind him, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of trying to emphasise that the light's coming from over his shoulder. So it's really subtle, but you can see like almost like a little light bloom that's hitting his currently right shoulder. Um, the other thing you'll see me doing occasionally is flipping the image horizontally. So you can hit F2 in Photoshop and it'll flip it back and forward. I have noticed that. What's what's the idea of flipping it? Um, it's, it's a visual trick. Most people, depending on whether you're left-handed or right-handed, you'll look at something and you won't actually realise you're doing it, but... It'll look better a certain way, so I don't know if you'll see me do it here yet. Um, it's something I'll do. I won't do it constantly, but every 10 or 15 minutes I might just stop, zoom back on the image and have a look at it. And if you hit F2, normally in Photoshop, flips it horizontally. Otherwise you can go to the view menu and go flip canvas horizontally. And that basically mirror images it flips it horizontally, which quite often if you, it's quite surprising you'll be looking at an image and if you flip it, Suddenly you go, oh, it doesn't look right. Like one little piece of it, maybe his ear's too big. Because your brain reads things different from left to right. So mm -hmm. you flip it back and forth three or four times, and you can just double check that it looks good both ways. And it's a good way to eliminate stuff that you're currently not seeing that's a bit weird. Mm. Um, yeah, it helps, helps remove that. Sometimes you'll pass an image, you might have been working on it for three hours, and you'll pass it to someone beside you and say, can you look at this? And they'll go, why is, why is that ear so big? And you just haven't seen it because you've, you've been so engrossed in it that um, you missed the little stuff. Okay, uh, so, so and it's changing trick. your perspective and point of view on it from time to time. Yeah, and at the moment in the video, you can see I'm throwing some blood and splatter on the floor and I'm using the transform tool to kind of give it some sense of perspective, like depth. So you'll probably see me, I think I delete this layer because I decided I didn't like it. Yep. <laughs> then I'll add another layer where I'm trying to get a bit more grungy, grimy, splattery stuff on the floor, which is, it's not really necessary to do a character, but it just little things like a bit of splatter and a shadow on the ground underneath them helps sell the reality of whether, yeah. it's, whether it's real or or the difference between a well-rendered image and something that's just just a drawing, you know. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that's changed over the years is the availability of Photoshop to um, small studios. So I can remember 
Uh, we were trying to trying to use the GIMP at one point as our uh, mm. as our art package. This was long before your time, of course. But um, uh, these days, you can get the whole sort of the Adobe Creative Suite for like fifty dollars a month. So, yeah. So that really puts it within reach of um, the small studios. Uh, it's, it's definitely like someone who was looking at getting into it. It's diff like a, you always speak to sort of younger artists who are just starting out and they're still drawing just with pencils, which is good. But you really do at some point need to be able to use something like Photoshop or some digital version. Um, and use a Wacom tablet as well? Yeah, a Wacom tablet and a Wacom pen. Mm. Um, it's, it's nearly impossible to work in a, like a studio environment just using a mouse. Like um, I've seen people who are great pencil sketches and they prefer to work that way, but just the way studios tend to work, you need to be able to really use something like Photoshop. Okay. Um, well, I guess we should probably move on to the to the next person, but we're actually going to have a uh, do an entire hour with you at some point. Um, getting you to create a piece of concept art from beginning to end, and we'll speed that up and sort of compress it into an hour. Yep. And we'll um, get you to talk through that process um, probably later this week or cool. earlier just, next week. I'm going to interrupt you. We've got a chat here. Uh, oh. Sorry, we didn't notice that earlier. Um, all right, if you were starting out from scratch again prior to having some 2D modelling study, what would you do in, uh, What would you do different in terms of pursuing learning? Um... So was it the prior to? Prior to, yeah. Um, yeah, if you were starting out from scratch, so prior to having some 2D modelling study, what would you do different in, term, in terms of learning? Like learning... Did you do it uh, the right way or would you do it differently? Um, for me, I, in an ideal world, I would have known before I went to university that what I wanted to do, if you know what I mean. Like yeah. I did a design degree and focused on product design, sort of with like designing toasters and trolleys and things like that, kind of similar mm -hmm. to industrial design. Mm -hmm. If I'd known, I mean, back then, the games industry wasn't like anything anywhere near like it is now. So it was barely even a course at a lot of universities. So in hindsight, if, uh, if the timing was right and I'd known about it, I would have done an actual course. You know, it's hugely beneficial. To, there's, there's a lot of stuff you learn in that that I probably don't know that I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's stuff I quite. The bonus of teaching yourself is, I guess, you can do another job and still have an income while you're learning until you get to a point where you go, right, I know enough now. I need to work for a games company and you go do a career swap. Probably the yeah the thing that I would have done different most of all would have been to actually do a course but it's just the way it was when I went through university the courses weren't there not like today. So. Actually at University of Canterbury now they have a Bachelor of Product Design uh, that includes a video game development stream Yeah, which is um, you know, amazing how far things have come in the last few years. Yeah exactly so, so there's a plethora of different options out there of, and maybe for someone who maybe they were a bit older and they wanted to get into the, they've always wanted to do it, and they're thinking of changing, changing um, vocations, then probably start with just working from home and seeing if you can, if you actually enjoy it. Like obviously it's probably not wise just to quit your day job and move to a studio if you have no idea what you're doing, because you've got to kind of. Um, You've got to really get embedded in the online stuff. Like there's a lot of websites like conceptart.org and mappainting.org where you can actually see not only finished work that's been done by professionals, but a lot of um, little free online tutorials and little um, downloadable documents that say how to how to do a speed painting or how to do an environment study, things like that. So you've got to kind of look at every avenue is the digital online avenue of training and yeah probably so, the so biggest yours is primarily youtube stuff did you did, did you have the opportunity to use something like linda or udemy or anything like well that? no not not so much they were available but i what i did actually in a lot was into competitions um even if you were yeah. thought you were hopeless at the time and generally some of the stuff you made was hopeless because you're still learning how to do it. 
Um, there's always online competitions, whether it be concept art or matte painting or whatever you're into, whether it's 3D modelling. The bonus of that is that the competitions force you to um, submit work in progresses, so you can't just sort of cheat your way around the fringes and get to the final result. You have to submit an initial sketch and um, sort of a block and image, and then maybe if you're modelling something, your know, initial block and shapes, and then the detail. What's a block in just for what? Uh, block in is just like if you were, I guess you, I'd just say it's similar if you were sculpting someone's head, a block in would be when you just put big blobs of clay on. Um, and get the rough shapes there. And it's the same in 2D painting as it is in 3D model modeling. And that block in is when you just get the rough, rough in shapes. In 2D sense, you might be just doing rough shapes of big rocks and where a house might be. And then you start polishing from there and adding details. But initially, all you want is the position of things in the scene and you're looking at composition. Like if you don't want to out of balance shot where you've got a giant rock here, a giant rock here and a little guy in the middle and it's perfectly symmetrical, it's not a beautiful shot. You kind of want something that's a bit askew, like maybe it's the camera's tilted around, things like that. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff you learn along the way. But entering those competitions forces you to do it the right way because you're being online critiqued by other artists. And there's prizes at the end, so. Yeah, nice. So I, I won a few. Quite often, these online arts challenges will the prizes will be training material, so that's a good way to get around it. If you do win something, you might win maybe two DVDs, and there's uh, you know quite a number of hours of training material for free that you can watch. And in the process of doing that, you get slightly better, and next time you win five DVDs. So. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Lincoln. No okay. more questions for you, so, uh, yeah, we'll let you go. Which fact then shall I send and, over yeah, next? Yeah, can you send over <laughs> Sergi? And also start the camera behind your uh, monitor again so we can catch the rest of that. Sergi, your, your, your uh, 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> <laughs> or 10 minutes, or... If we're just using your video, you're one minute. Maybe <laughs> less. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so Sergi uh, basically does uh, is primarily 3D modeler here. So he does um, <coughs> sculpting um, of characters and then you know putting uh, textures on them, normal maps on them, which mm -hmm. we discussed normal maps the other day. Um, so, Sergi, tell us what you would start doing when you when you're presented with one of Lincoln's orthographics, such as this marvelous one of King Leon, which you've already made. So. Ah, okay, the King Leon was an interesting uh, model to make. Uh, the first step that I that I started with was with taking this orthographic view that it's yeah. pretty well done, and using as a reference for me to start sculpting. Um, the model. So just roughly speaking, um, just playing. It's like playing with uh, clay. So you just take some cubes and spheres and whatever the base mesh you have, and then start sculpting from there. What tool do you actually use for that, Sergio? I use ZBrush as my main tool for that, and I usually take the base meshes for all the models that I can have, like bipeds or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, from that point, uh, from that beginning, I start uh, doing the, the model itself. Okay. There's quite a lot of deformation that I imagine goes into going from a normal bipedal <laughs> character to something that's mostly bones Yeah. with uh, a lot of decoration. Exactly. <laughs> this was a very interesting thing because the original yeah. base model, one of the base models was just a skeleton, but it came uh, by default for, and in ZBrush, so you okay. have the proportions and things like that. So in base of that, you start uh, adding other uh, pieces of, of geometry and start sculpting other shapes. But at least you can have the proportions very quickly, and that's a good point. Okay, let's um, slip over and start start your movie. There we go. Get out of that. All right, we're not. Uh, we haven't got a very good way of actually showing this stuff.
Mm -hmm. uh, so people get to see me starting stuff on the desktop. So this is um, this is King Leon that mm -hmm. uh, we're actually looking at there. Uh, we are looking at the final model. This is an Unreal uh, in-game model, real time. Um, it's in typos at the moment, so because it doesn't have any kind of rig. So we, the next stage for him, well, at the moment I am making his weapon, but the next stage for him will be uh, start rigging it and animating. But at the moment it's just like a, like a static mesh that is just uh, in typos. And, that's it. But we can see here and all the all the mapping, all the texture mapping done, all the small details that he has. All the I really love the metallic reflections of the horns and gauntlets, pauldrons. Me too. It's amazing how closely he looks like the 2D reference that uh, Lincoln yeah. gave you. The, the, the thing is that the, the that's something we were speaking with Lincoln. Um, we decided to make his neck like more fleshy and not mm -hmm. just bony as the original, the original concept. Mainly because uh, we really thought that maybe this character needed like it's the final boss, so maybe mm -hmm. he has to be like. Oh, like, he's the final boss. Yeah, it's the final boss. Uh -huh. So yes, he needed to be like bigger and I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, bigger and more threatening. So, yeah, more threatening, maybe something like that. So I just started taking that concept and we just uh, talk about this and made some small changes to, to this. And so he's about a foot higher than the other zombies, isn't yeah, he, when, when we actually see him in real life? It's a couple of meters, two meters ten, more or less. Yeah. Uh, more or less like me. So we put him in... Um, We've actually got him in Unreal, and we put him with the other zombies yeah. uh, so that we could actually try this in virtual reality, mm. just to get an idea of the height. And uh, yeah, he's an impressive looking guy alongside the other zombies. Mm. Uh, really? Yeah. Do you have to look up with your VR? Yeah. Yes, yeah. you oh. do. Yes, you do. I need to see this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we have to put you in there, but I think we have to put the audience in there too. So yeah. um, we have to arrange sometime this week to actually uh, get some screen capture of what it's actually like in the in the game. You can see, you know, part of the cave system behind, and you can see another couple of zombies in T pose. Mm. One of them wearing a barrel. Is that right? <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is, does he have no pants or something? This, this is the smallest scene I, I made for myself to test in the models, and in, in very similar lighting conditions like Lincoln's cave. But uh, yes, I have the other the skeleton soldier. I have the model over there. Just like, the original one is the behind the barrel. <laughs> okay. Not the one in the barrel. But yeah, it's just 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 making some fun with some of the models sometimes. So tell us about the materials because I really love the way the gold and metal all actually works in this. Ah yes. Um, well, uh, for texturing, I use Substance Painter. Substance Painter is a, a very impressive tool for um, PBR texturing. PBR is physically based material, physical based rendering, and it's based on physical based materials. So uh, it's, uh, today's standards is quite easy to make metallic surface, but in old times it was like very difficult to make these kind of materials in real time. Mm -hmm. So today's is very different. Uh, so yeah. He has different values for, for, for the pieces that we can see here. For example, the gauntlets, horns, and pauldrons. Not the leather pauldrons, the pauldrons in, just in, in the other. It's just in behind, no. It's mm -hmm. under the, the leather pauldrons. Okay. They are metallic as well, so yes. So those things that are sort of laid, laid over the top of each other? Yes. He has uh, two different kind of pauldrons. Yeah, so the leather over the top and then the metallic ones underneath. Yeah. And underneath that, he's wearing chainmail, so there's some beautifully detailed chainmail. Yes, yes, it's another material that I use for the chainmail. Just I just had to be aware about the UV layout. It was very important to have the, the correct UV layout for that to have the chainmail going across the surface correctly. Okay. And the same for the pants. We cannot see the pants here, but because it's covered by the I don't know the name of this. I always tell 
a skirt, but I don't know if yeah. that's a skirt or something. Yeah, I don't. The heavy leather. Somebody who knows about armor, send, tell us what that what that thing's actually called. But for uh, now, it's a skirt. Yeah, it was uh, underneath. A light summer piece, dress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this it's it's a chainmail armor as well. For okay. The pants, so. Oh yeah, so we can see the armor here, but I can't yet see a good. Oh, you can sort of see the chainmail on the arms hmm. a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, and we can see just and there, oh, yeah. just as yeah. yeah, under underneath the arm, you can see the chain. Yeah, and a piece of flesh that he has. Mm. It's like a remaining of his arm, or something like that. Beautifully so, detailed. I mean, Sergi's gone all out on this. Normally, incredible. what we would do to save time is the bits you're not going to look at much. We wouldn't do a great a lot of detail on, mm -hmm. but uh, I think everybody loves this project, and things just get to, and just getting done to a to a completely other standard now. Mm. Yeah, when I saw the original concept, I decided that this would be a very interesting model to make, so I'm pretty happy about the result, and it's like, it's like the, the little child that you have, you know, <laughs> <laughs> ironically. So is it your job to make sure that he moves correctly? No, no that's no. Linda's job. Okay. Uh, she will add the, the rig, the skeleton for the model, and then she will uh, animate the model as well. So I'm just a uh, sculpt model and texturing mostly and UV and wrap and but all the stages before animating. Oh cool. Yeah. That's my job. <laughs> it's amazing the sort of things that are going on here that you don't really appreciate. So you're looking at the reflections on that on mm -hmm. that stuff that are to do with the material, you're looking at some of the fine detail that's another you know, layer of instructions, the normal map basically telling yeah. uh, telling light how to react when it actually hits the surface. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of things going on here that people don't appreciate um, when they think of 3D modelling. Uh, especially, I suppose, since a lot of people see quite cartoonish stuff as um, 3D modelling, but, you know, here where you're going for a level of realism and, um, I guess, what would you call it, sort of immersion, yes. where we really want people to get into this thing and feel that it's real for them. Uh, there's, yeah, there's just a whole lot of stuff that's gone into that, that um, outside of Sergi's job. And I really think at some point we probably need to put together a compilation video of sculpting and texturing and normal mapping sure. um, yeah. and get you up here for an hour as well to sort of talk us through that process yeah. so that people can see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, are there any questions for Sergi? Uh, oh, no, the last question was, do you have chat open? Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, and it, again, somebody's trying to whisper to us, but for some reason I can't see the whispers. They're just popping up off my screen. Oh no, there is one there. Okay. Uh, I can actually see the whispers, but uh, yeah, nothing that I need to actually tell anybody about here. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, Sergi. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting um, insights. Um, let's uh, get Linda over and we'll uh, oh. start talking about Linda's thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. See ya. <laughs> it's cool going through the, the three stages of each character development, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, in this project in particular, I'm absolutely delighted the way things are coming together. And we're testing all the time too, so when we come up with a character like this and we're worried about the frame rate, we can actually put them straight into the, the environment now that we've got artists actually doing that. Hello, Linda. Hi. <laughs> yeah, now that we've got artists doing that, we can put them straight into the environment and we can check out the frame rate, we can see how well it's performing. We can put them in with 20 zombies coming from each direction and start shooting at them and see. So that was it was really worthwhile getting that initial environment up and running so that we can test everybody's creations. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Linda here uh, is our animator. And we'll just pull up her animation stuff here. Now, you will have seen a bit of her actually starting the recording stuff <laughs> in the background. So, Linda, yes. uh, animator. <laughs> so what's the first t task we actually do when we're animating um, one of these characters? 
Of uh, course, we need a model first, and mm -hmm. then we need to use the uh, like in the Maya we uh, basically use the human IK to create a basic rig. And, um, so that's a rig we're looking at now. Is that the thing on yes, the right hand on side? on the right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like a skeleton for this. Yes, it has um, some base just like the, uh, like a human being, and if you need to add some extra bones, you need to add by hand, just like the bag on the right. Just and like the what? Sorry, I'm the right. the bag, the okay. uh, yeah, the uh, um, like shop bag. The yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, because this one has to hold a sword, so that's yeah. unusual for our zombies. He has to hold a sword, and even uh, equally importantly, he has to be able to let go of that sword in combat if we were to knock it out of his hand or shoot it out of his hand. Yeah. Yeah. So, how much complexity does it add actually having a sword? Um, for the sword, um, like we could just, uh, if we create a model, um, combine the sword with the uh, body mesh, uh, we cannot uh, just uh, using the same rig. But for this one, we just uh, like uh, parent the uh, separate mesh sword uh, to the hand. Okay. So, yeah. So we can change the uh, weapon if we need to do some sort uh, uh, need to parent a different sort uh, for this character. So it's a, a good way to do the uh, weapon animation. And and for the uh, animation, actually we are uh, uh, import uh, animation records from the mocap resource. Um, so we need to. Uh, so just to explain that, so yeah. mocap basically is motion capture that we've got. Um, I think we downloaded some that so we bought from yes. one of the online stores. Yes. Um, some motion capture for walking and fighting. Yeah. Um, I think it already had a zombie basis, as I remember. So yes. we were actually working with zombies. But for the attack to animation, uh, it's just uh, like normally just like the hand from the left or to yeah. the right. But for, uh, for this character, we need to uh, animate the like, uh, special with the attack with source. So we need to do some uh, like changes in animation. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just the important part is the right hand. We need to do some rotation so we could uh, fix the um, like the sword uh, point direction. Okay. Yeah. So what we're looking at down the bottom there is the timeline of the animation. Yes. Is that right? And you're uh, are you creating like keyframes in that timeline when when you're actually moving the sword around? Because yeah. we can see you're doing lots of positioning of sword and hand and all the rest of it. Yeah, if we create the animation just from the uh, uh, this pose to another pose, we normally uh, couldn't see so many uh, keyframes in the uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, we could we see the like lots of uh, keyframes in the timeline because also those. Uh, those keyframes are also from the uh, mocap animation. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the and mocap stuff has lots of keyframes. Yes, yeah. that's a big part for the mocap source. So it, it's really hard to fix some parts with so many <laughs> keyframes. <laughs> okay, um, one of the other things we're doing is uh, seeing you. Uh, change your point of view, so switching so that you're looking down on it from yeah. looking front on it. Tell me why you're doing that. It is more um, easy to see from the three view than you just see the, uh, the one view. And, and if you, uh, if you see the thing like that, I, I just create a kind of like curve to show the um, animation like. Uh, Kind of like animation curve, mm -hmm. yes. just like uh, from the uh, this time to another time, and you can see the line 
actually the this joint is going from then so you can is that tracking the hand yes, or the point that's tracking yes, the hand the wrist. and so you can exactly know uh, which kind of uh, which keyframe is actually have some small issues and by changing the uh, so like uh, I'm checking uh, line and then you can fix the some really weird animation. It's kind of like uh, kind of like tricky to uh, with the um, human eye key. I really love this part. You know, you know, when the animations go in, and those you know fantastic. 3D models that uh, Sergi puts together suddenly come to life. Mm. Yeah, they're, you know, they're actually attacking, walking. Um, uh, so tell me about, because uh, if we didn't have motion capture, mm -hmm. um, and for some of this, like there's no run cycle for this guy, yeah. We have to use reference. Yes. Um, so tell me about reference. How we actually get the reference for that? Uh, we. I think I've got a video that can help oh, in the yeah. explanation. Okay. By the way. Okay. Uh, I just we need um, just like casting some video, just like uh, actor or actress do some interesting uh, animations. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> this is Margaret. Uh, since Margaret's not here today, yes, she will be angry with us. <laughs> well, we wanted to be in the show, though. Uh, that's Margaret getting somewhat impatient with me, not because I was not satisfied with the with yeah. the run cycle she was doing. Margaret's tired with the like yeah. running for twenty times. <laughs> at, this stage, yeah, at, this, at this stage, she'd already been doing this for like thirty five minutes, so <laughs> she was actually getting pretty tired. She's getting more and more zombie like. Yeah. Every time. But she kept yeah. bending her knees, and I wanted something that was a lot more stiff legged. Um, so, and she was sort of getting it there, so I thought I'd come back to the camera and doing it and do it. You know, we would like to ask Brooke to act in like this, but Brooke's uh, body is not quite like the skinny. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's true. I'm, I am not agile, I am not light and skinny, so I've got a definite idea in my mind, but I can't act without. Uh, and that's Margaret getting sick of the whole thing. <laughs> So I think we decided to go with the last take, but it still wasn't really what we want. And since then, I think we've changed our mind, and the last take isn't good enough. So now, the other thing that's going on here is that uh, I was filming. So we had the camera set up, um, looking straight down that way. Yep. Uh, there's Linda. Who <laughs> that's a lot of fun with it. Um, so we had this one camera looking straight down that way, but Linda was actually capturing film from the side as well. Uh -huh. So, and uh, I guess what you don't see, you might see in the other uh, reference image, is uh, occasionally I was clapping my hands in front of the camera uh, with it making a loud sound. <laughs> <laughs> to try it, yes, she was pretty annoyed. <laughs> Uh, making a loud sound to try and coordinate the two cameras so that we can um, see the side, synchronize the side view and the front view, yeah. so that we can capture the positions of the feet and the yes. knees and all the rest of it. That's a technique that I think Disney pioneered it back in the old days. It's called rotoscoping. So this is before they had motion capture, but you get that wonderfully realistic motion that you see in Snow White. Mm. Um, and so forth. That's yeah. They just did by rotoscoping, filming from two different angles and coordinating them. All oh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Old, old-fashioned mocap. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to Linda's. I forget where we got to now, but let's assume it was about there. Yeah. Is that about right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, what are the what are um, some of the problems that you actually encounter in animating from um, 
Well, in this case, you're animating, you're taking mocap and you're adjusting it. So, what are, the, what are some of the problems with actually adjusting mocap? Yeah, it's like um, for this special cap to just need to like rotate the wrist, mm -hmm. and also uh, for the uh, uh, mocap source, we just uh, like um, like the capture the first pose and the end pose are actually are different. The other mm -hmm. is uh, casting by the human, so it's not just like uh, created by the machine. It cannot uh, require the first time, uh, the first frame and the end frame are wow. exactly the same pose. So that's we want to to fix. Like, and that's because we want to be able to loop these things. Yes, right? yeah. yes. We we need to uh, copy the first frame and and place in the end frame, then we need to adjust the middle frame by the, uh, by the end, end of this part, about maybe 10 or 20 frames. Also, like the walking, mm -hmm. uh, usually uh, from the uh, resource is from from the, this point to another point is like a distance. Yeah. So well, for the game, we need the character just uh, in place. Yeah, so we need them like they're on a treadmill, so yeah. they're walking but not actually going anywhere. Yes. Yeah, so the mocap source, they actually move. Yes. So we have to cancel out that distance. Yes. And so, so I have to like uh, fix the root uh, animation part, just no move. So uh, for those parts, it's kind of like different than, uh, uh, than the traditional, just like uh, from the animation by, from the hand. Okay, so how did you get into animation, Linda? Sorry? How did you get into it? How did you start uh, animating? What Did you do a course? What did you actually do? E, yeah, we just from uh, like a single ball, from like a bouncing ball. Mm -hmm. uh, at my, I, I can remember at my first lesson in the school, we learning how the, the small ball is bouncing. Where was your school? Uh, my uh, first animation school in China. Okay. And, and but here, well, I was learning in the same learning in the net course. Now it's calling the UB. UB. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We we also need to learn how to uh, act in the animation uh, web service. So it's very interesting to just uh, just like kind of. Uh, to each other and do some something really fun. <laughs> oh, now we can see sort of full slash animation with that sword. Yeah, for this uh, for this animation file, uh, I just uh, create two animation parts together. So the animation one is from frame one to frame sixty, another one is from uh, sixty to the one hundred twenty four, I guess. Uh, well, the first part is the sword from the right to left, and not the left to right. If we are using so for the backslash, basically. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm just uh, fixing the uh, feet part, kind of like. Uh, I can't even see what was wrong there, but clearly there's something, <laughs> something that your eye caught. <laughs> yeah. Do you find this project to be a, a really interesting project to work on? This, yes. How's this compared to what you normally, the sorts of things we normally do? It's, it's more realistic um, animation. Yeah, just like uh, I created the animation before, it's more like. Uh, Cartoon style and it's kind of like uh, very uh, less uh, keyframes in the timeline, but in here um, it's kind of like uh, it's more difficult to fix lots of keyframe parts from the oh, I, I can see the roll of the ankle there that you're trying to fix up. Yeah, now I need to delay some and use less. Keyframes, yeah, for easily to adjust the. Now, when you delete those keyframes, I guess you're losing a little bit of realism. 
Oh yeah. But you know, just uh, like balance. Yeah. Well, we're making a good compromise, I think, between motion capture and something that loops properly. Yes. For the game. Yeah. How do you deal with um, getting them to do moves that are unusual to this loop? Mm -hmm. Is that all its own specific animation as well? Yes. It, it's kind of like um, even you have the um, the animation resource, you still need to sometimes you need to lift your your chair and and exactly do the same thing and see what's the difference. Like the uh, the fit part, uh, uh, the fit part, just like uh, if it. In the original one, it's kind of like just pin on the ground and no move at all. But but if you do like that, you will feel uncomfortable. So you need to do some uh, teach from that uh, joint. So you use yourself as reference. <laughs> yes. But you, but you don't let us film you when you're doing it. Yes. <laughs> I'm like a uh, the, those kind of experience. <laughs> like for the uh, um, have a uh, home who like uh, have a lot of experience who can imagine those kind of animation in the mind, but not for me. <laughs> I still need the yeah, still need my experiment. <laughs> Sometimes I will go to the toilet to see the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get a full length mirror and still them here. Yeah, yeah, that's, good, that's one thing we could do. Put a full length mirror in there. That might actually help the work. <laughs> We've so, had a couple of people say hi, so hello to Queen Man 12 and Wilson 2. <laughs> oh, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, people actually joining in. Absolutely, hope you <laughs> learned something. Feel free to look through any questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, questions uh, Questions for any of our people is fine. Um, <laughs> we can call them back if there's uh, something interesting to talk about. Absolutely. Yeah. So, tell me, do you find it annoying when I take so long to film reference stuff because I'm fussy about what happens? <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, for different people just like me. and I just like um, to be silent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's not easy for me, especially not uh, English, not my first language, so it's kind of like... Um, a little bit difficult, <laughs> but I hope you can understand. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you do very well. Uh, I think we mostly understand you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At least I have to explain something. <laughs> and certainly as you do more, more streaming, you're going to <laughs> get very confident in your English. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I... I I'm very happy to what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, is there anything else to add? Have we seen enough of that video? Have we? Yeah. Maybe next time you can show how how I animate from the uh, custom reference. <laughs> well, I think one of the things we can yeah one of the things we should probably do is do a um, a sort of video compilation for, so that uh, you can show some rigging, you can show... Oh yes, maybe um, for the next character, like the, yeah. the character you show before. Yeah. The, yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, we should film when you're actually doing the um, rigging and animating for King Leon. Yes. Yeah, we'll see his full journey. That would be that would be really cool. Be yeah, that would be amazing. really, yeah. really a, that's a good job. <laughs> <laughs> really happy with all the video we're actually capturing of all the stuff we're doing. Yeah. So this is the best, most documented journey, most documented game that we've ever had. Thanks to um, uh, to Twitch for giving us a platform to, to stream it out and show people. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for that, Linda. Thank you. I think that's. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So, what did you think of that, Fiona? So interesting. I had no idea about any of this kind of um, what's actually involved in it. It's incredibly intense. Just you know, looking at ten minutes on the way that this particular zombie's ankles are, it's 
It's, yeah. It's not light work, so it's amazing seeing how much actually goes into the development of an entire game and thought behind the characters and, I mean, even, this is just the animation part of it, I mean, yeah. the, the story development and, and the gameplay and the mechanics, it's all... Yeah, I guess you can start to get an idea of where the cost of developing a video game actually comes in. When yeah. You look at some of the jobs these people do and how meticulous they have to be just to keep the realism uh, going in the game. So The realism when it comes to zombies, I love that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You want them to be, as odd as it sounds, you want them to be realistic zombies. They have to be able to move, constrained by the way a zombie would move. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have to, you know, so... The bones have to be real. The you know the, the way they articulate has to be real, um, but also the the way they're dressed is you know got to, it's got to fit in with the time period. It's got to actually look like it's been on the journey that the zombie's been on. So being buried, being decayed. Mm -hmm. being, so yeah, we talk about realism. Of course, uh, not many zombies to study in real life, <laughs> but nonetheless, people have a fixed idea of the way zombies are. And what we want to do is actually enrich that. We want to go that little step further and just, you know, add the details that make people really feel like they're immersed in an actual zombie apocalypse. Yeah, and I guess uh, VR allows us to do that, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, VR is going to be great, but the, the premium experience. Of course, we're doing it as normal uh, screen version as well mm -hmm. um, because we want everybody to be able to play it. But, yeah, certainly the... Uh, uh, VR is going to be the premium version, so actually getting in there. And uh, we, I guess we can't wait to show you guys either. Oops, we've had some more input there. We have. Um, oh, okay. That's an so awesome idea. Somebody suggested that we contact uh, an institution that provides courses for 3D modelling game dev and, um, uh, yeah, basically get their students to have a look at the stream. Maybe we can get some students actually on to give some background to what they're actually doing in the in courses. Um, yeah, so some really cool stuff to do there. Yeah. Well, uh, we hope that you're enjoying seeing the uh, the background on how these games are created and developed from from the get go. Yeah. But I think probably the next most important thing to do is to get. Uh, to get some video of uh, what it's like inside the game currently. So we haven't got all the animations happening, we haven't got everything working, but we've got um, some really roughed out ideas of the gameplay. Um, and so you can actually get in there, you will be attacked by zombies that will come towards you and yeah, you can shoot them and, and drop them. Um, we even had our own art director get a fright when she was playing, so yeah. we're doing well so far. <laughs> oh, I should have put that video We up should there. have put we that should video. Have, yeah. Should have, yeah. Head along to our Facebook page, After the Light VR. Oh, was it After the Light Game? After the Light Game, I After think. the Light Game on yeah. Facebook, and you, you'll see Margaret get a fright. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so not much actually frightens Margaret in games, strangely. <laughs> but this one, she just turned around, and uh, somehow while she was uh, shooting a stream of uh, zombies, one had sneaked up behind her. <laughs> As she turned, she got quite the, she was quite startled, uh, which was uh, great to see actually, because Margaret's really a sort of barometer for how well we're doing on the on the fried stuff. Because uh, yeah, mostly these things don't uh, don't frighten her. Uh, people in the building frighten her. She gets jump scared a lot. <laughs> they do. Yep, that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> There's a war between officers. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right, so look, how are we doing for time? Um, okay, two minutes to basically finish off. Um, if anybody has any more questions, happy to answer them. Um, I guess we're showing something bizarre on the background there. Oh, we are, yeah. Sorry, that's where Linda's freeze frame. Back on. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so uh, yeah, showing you what to, what's actually happening in the caves is great. I hope we can capture the sound really well as, uh, as well. We've got some fantastic stuff happening. Like um, I was looking at the other day and some of the detail that's been added now, like these tiny water drips that are happening from the ceiling and this, you know, along with the sound and all the rest of it, um, it's really starting to feel you know, rich and um, absolutely immersive. Uh, it doesn't take you long to feel you're actually in a cave and not sitting in a seat with a with a headset on <laughs> um, after a while. 
uh, yeah, fun tipping zombies over the edge of um, one pathway where they can actually fall down a wall if you shoot them early enough. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so that's one thing. We'll, um, we'll follow up with Lincoln and Sergi and Linda on, uh, but we'll basically we'll have an episode devoted to each of their jobs. Um, so and uh, basically show the stuff that we've actually completed and got to so far. Um, I guess at some point we probably should do a marketing thing as well, so we can show people how we're actually marketing after the light. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, basically give some details for anybody that wants to follow us. In the meantime, make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We've got After the Light VR and After the Light Game VR for Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and catch us, I guess, every day at 1pm. Indeed. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks again to uh, our artists that were on today. So Lincoln, who did the concept art and uh, created an orthographic for us. Um, Sergi, who uh, showed us his um, King Leon model that actually followed um, some orthographic art that we showed you. And uh, Linda, who showed us um, the joy of animating or at least uh, reanimating something that had previously had mocap and making it a, um, a feasible game um, animation. All right, thank you, and we'll see you again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Take care. All right. Let's see if I can <laughs> turn this thing off without looking like a complete...